Good morning. It's good to be back with you all. It really, really is. It really, really is. Um, just to worship the Lord. Man, it's wonderful to worship the Lord. And uh, just welcome to all those who are visiting. It's great to have you. Uh, Happy New Year. It is, it's the first time I've preached in quite a while. I was sick. Many of you know. I went away. And so I just want to just start by thanking some people. Can I do that real quick? Let me get, and get into the Word. But I am healthy. And uh, get, yep. Yep, it's wonderful. And, uh, and I'm also happy, which is nice. Added bonus. Do you know that, you know, you forget how much that we have a triune God, three in one, and so he made us in his image, and we're three in one. Body, soul, actually spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5. And you just forget, when you're not healthy, I didn't realize how sick I was. That's the truth. I really didn't. You don't realize how sick you have been. I was sick, we realized, for maybe six, seven years. But you don't realize how sick you've been until you get healthy. And you're like, oh, this feels nice. <laughs> you know, this is, this, this is better. It's like they say, I've been rich, I've been poor. Rich is better. Like I've been healthy, I've been sick. Healthy is better. And so it's been wonderful. The, the best thing is just being, being able to do stuff with my boys again. You know, we, we've been for going for cycles and runs and walks and hikes and do whatever. Because, you know, I can exercise without getting sick. So it's been really, it's been life-changing and wonderful. But I want to thank uh, all of you firstly. I want to thank all of you for so many things, but I want to thank you for your prayers. You know, it was very humbling to come back and, or to even get phone calls or texts or emails about just, I'm praying. Uh, some people even fasted. I mean, I was, it's very humbling, but I felt it. It was, you know, when I was away and hungry and not eating and seeking the Lord, it was one of the easiest fasts I've ever done. And that's, I, can, I believe with all my heart, that has to do with your prayers. And so I was very grateful, but I was also very grateful that you didn't become spectators. You know, we've endeavored to build a culture here that is not around a person, a personality, a charismatic gift, a name, an anointing. No, we've endeavored to build around God's presence and that we are all His saints. And to hear just, I mean, the, what was happening, it's like everything carried on without, nothing skipped a beat. And I think that's good. Yeah? I think that's healthy. When someone leaves and the church is like, oh, we don't know what to do, and people become spectators, and that's not, that's not okay. That's not in the New Testament. And so I was so encouraged just to see things continue, and I want to thank you for that. I really do. You know, I've always said this pulpit doesn't belong to a person, it belongs to Jesus Christ. And so do you. You don't belong to people. You belong to Him. Amen. I want to thank the staff, the volunteers, the leaders, the entire leadership team, all that were here, all that served, even the volunteers, all that just worked and served, uh, obviously while I was away, to the eldership team, to their families for releasing them. Um, and I want to tell you, these guys, they love and shepherd you in their heart. You may not know them personally or see them, but they do. They genuinely do. They pray for you. They love you. They shepherd you. They're concerned for you. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see. Just they stepped in and just did everything. And I also want to thank my parents for making themselves available. It's really helpful to have them in our midst. Just they experience the wisdom, the anointing on their life. And they just stepped in and were available and helpful. And, and we're obviously all grateful for that. Um, I want to thank all of those that occupied the pulpit. You know, I kept hearing about the entire church responded, and God's presence was one, and it's just so healthy. And thank you. It's hard work. And so I don't know if you know if they're all here, but all those that occupied the pulpit, thank you. Can we just thank them? <laughs> Wonderful. You know, I've been, I've been going to the gym. I saw that young man in the gym yesterday. I think it was you, right? I saw him in the gym, and when I was running on the treadmill, when he was running, it looked very different. To look very different, so <laughs> I'll get there. But um, most of all, honestly, I want to thank my wife. You know, uh, she's single parented for over a month. That's hard, man. And she homeschooled, and she led worship, and she did a lot and led the staff and sorted our Christmas service. She took care of all sorts of responsibilities on her own, and I want to thank you. 
today, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is our anniversary. Uh, wonderful. 13 years. Uh, 13, right? And uh, tomorrow is my parents, no, today is my parents' anniversary, 100, 113 years. How long? 44, 45? 46 years. Congrats. What did he say? Two life sentences. <laughs> well, he's going to hear about that. So, it is also interesting, just by the way, when I went to uh, this retreat, retreat center stuff, I arrived. We set aside dates in November, and we planned it once I actually got a word from the Lord. Where's Ricardo? Is he around? I want to honor that man. Can you stand, Ricardo? I wonder if we can honor him. Thank you. I know he doesn't like this, but I prayed and I asked the Lord. I felt too fast. I had people tell me I shouldn't, and I said, Lord, if, if you want me to do that, I need, a, I need a word of the Lord. And that man came to me out of the blue and, and gave me a word of the Lord and told me exactly what to do, and he was spot on, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you. And, um, but it's, what's interesting is after I arrived there, I heard that Bill Johnson, for those of you who know him, Bill Johnson had called an international uh, fast, basically sending it out to all churches, all leaders who would want to participate with them, and from the 2nd to the 23rd of December. And what struck me is my wife only said, you wouldn't believe it. Those were the exact dates that I'd set aside to do a 21-day fast. And I, I say that because not makes that special. We don't realize that even in weakness or even in struggle, the Lord will actually use what you're doing and use you to partner with what He's doing, even though you're not aware of it. It was the exact same dates. And so obviously while I was there, I did that. So now I want to do just a moment of ministry if we can. I was in here Friday night and I was just praying just in the sanctuary, just here, praying and worshiping and I started to just worship, and I, as I was doing that, I started to just pray for you guys, and pray for the church, pray for free life, pray for some of you by name, and a righteous anger um, rose up in me, because I saw this last season of just God's people being robbed, and it was like I got so angry in my spirit, and I, I know that the Lord's asked me to do this. So what I'm going to ask is, if you in this last season have just, you know, whether you call it the desert, where you feel like no matter what you've done, it's just been one thing after the next, after the next, and you just feel like everything's been in vain, you just feel like the enemy's robbed you. I want to pray a blessing over you because I believe that the Lord will change your season. And if that's how you feel, I'm asking you to stand. And some of you, if you wanted to come forward, you're welcome to. You don't have to. But I'm asking you to stand. And I just want to pray over you. And if any one of the guys want to pray, that's fine uh, as well. And I'm going to start it like this. There's a song that I actually wrote out. And that's what I feel to read out over you. But before I do this, can I ask you, don't worry about how you feel in this moment. Let's wait on the Lord, just for a moment. Holy Spirit, we invite you to touch your people. I invite your glory, Lord, in your presence. Let's just wait on the Lord. We love you, Lord. And I pray this over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and to your family and to your children and to their children and to their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. The Lord 
is with you. He is with you. Holy Spirit, I pray for your people tonight, or this, this morning, as you said for me to do. And in the name of Jesus, I pray a season to change. Elise, could you come here real quick? I pray for a season to change for every person that needs it, Lord. Lord, I break shackles off of your people. I break shackles off of your people tonight, to, to this morning. I just break shackles, the anointing to break yokes, to change seasons, to open bank accounts, to release hearts. Father, there are some here who are saying, Lord, I want to love you like I used to, but I can't seem to find it again. I pray joy to enter their heart, for the love of the Lord to enter their heart. I pray for a perspective shift to enter their life now in Jesus' name. Today, Lord, not tomorrow, today. And I change the season. Not I do, but I pray you do, Holy Spirit, to change seasons over people's lives, over ministries, over houses, over hearts. For those in business, I pray breakthrough, Lord. Breakthrough, no more uphill, breakthrough. For those who need jobs or careers, I pray open doors. Lord, change the season of your people to blessing and favor because after death comes resurrection. Yes, God. Yes. And in order to bring new wine, Lord, grapes have to be crushed. Yes. And some of you have been crushed. Lord, make it into wine in the name of Jesus. Dad, do you have anything you want to pray? Anybody? All right. Kev's going to pray for you. Go for it, bud. Stay standing. I asked any of them if they'd love to pray. Lord, we know your will for health for us. We know that healing is the children's bread. We know your will for freedom, that we'll know the truth. And knowing that revelation, knowing the truth will make us free. And so I command any lies to be exposed right now. In Jesus' name, lies will be exposed and then rejected and renounced. In Jesus' name. And I say that which is not lining up with your will, for your peace, for health, your presence, Lord, for freedom, I say shift course to align with God's will now, whether it's 180 or a slight shift. In Jesus' name, shift now. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you all. Why don't you take a seat? I just, and trust the Lord for it. Don't worry about an experience or feeling. Just trust the Lord for it. Trust the Lord for it. Speak it out. Lord, embrace what you have for us. Lord, embrace what you have for us. Speak it out. Tell your spouse. Even if they think you're weird, that's okay. I promise they already think you're weird. You just don't know. So, I wonder if you can uh, turn in your Bible to the book of John chapter 1. I'm going to read something out of Colossians 3. While I was away, this may shock some of you, I started reading the NLT. I, only, I mostly read, I'm pretty much only read the New King James, but the New Living Translation, and I absolutely love it. I'm going to probably preach out of this for a little bit, and uh, just to try and make things more simple, and uh, it helps to know, obviously, the, some of the original stuff, but uh, that's just where the Lord has led me. So, Colossians 3, you're in John 1, you can stay there. It says, whatever you do, work it with all your heart, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord not for human masters. King James says, as unto the Lord, not unto man. Can we say, unto the Lord? Lord. Why? Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. So what you do for the kingdom, the inheritance comes from Him. And what he's saying is, everything that you do in life can be for the kingdom if you know how to do that, if you understand, if you have that perspective. Your career can actually be turned into a kingdom activity, and then the inheritance you receive is from the Lord. So why don't you turn it into a kingdom activity and stop doing it for your boss? Yes, do it for him out of honor. Yes, be the best employee. But whatever you do, if you do it unto the Lord, you're going to do it better anyway, whether it's what you call ministry or work or parenting. If you do it unto the Lord, you're going to do it better. Plus, then you receive a reward. So everything you do, do it as unto the Lord, not as to people. 
and he says, for it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So, while I was away, just as we go into the year, this is funny. My watch is saying move. I have one of those watches that count my steps, and it's telling me I'm being too still. <laughs> so, I have to pace up and down, so it's not my fault, right? Uh, while I was away, I spent some time in the Word, just reading, and the place I went, Sedona, Arizona, is a weird place spiritually. It's like the spiritual hub of the nation. I didn't, I had no idea. There's New Age, superstores, mediums, occultists, uh, open Satanism, Native American medicine wheels and worship, and everything that you can imagine on, in every strip mall, aura readings, aura photos, tarot card, on, in every corner, every strip mall. And yet, strangely enough, while I was there, it's not oppressive, it's just open. But it's open to anything. And so you can imagine some of the people I met. I have some funny stories that I don't have the time to tell. Uh, I never knew, I never knew that a person could wear a t-shirt upside down. I learned that while I was there. A man took a t-shirt, turned it upside down, so really tight around this part of his body, was where his head would go, the hole. And nothing underneath, the sleeves backwards, and the bottom of the t-shirt rolled up like a polo neck. And I thought, man, that's, I never knew that. I never knew that. So there were some interesting people there. But, um, but while I was away, I just, I spent a lot of time in the New Testament, read probably a third or half of the New Testament, just reading through some books of Scripture, and it was so refreshing just to be in the Word and have the Lord uh, just minister to my heart. The Word is food. Yeah, we need it. But I was, it was so refreshing to be around the unsaved. And so often we can become so churchified and have so much jargon that I, I was so much surrounded by people that have absolutely no concept of God or an incorrect view or they've been hurt by the church. And it was so refreshing to me. And, and uh, you know, the demonic stuff, I don't care about that. I don't fear that. So, because he was in me is greater. So, it just, just doesn't bug me. And so, some of them were even doing weird occultic things and doing, so I thought, well, I'm going to do my thing. And my room had like a private deck on. So, I went out there and I worshiped. And I prayed on my knees and every day I'm doing my thing. And, and they're, you know, they probably thought it was weird, but I don't care. But I say this because some of today comes out of that context. The world is in an absolute mess. And instead of being fearful, I'm asking us this year, that's why it's first of the year, to see this as an uh, opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are desperate. They just don't know what they're desperate for. People are afraid. People, in, in every sphere of life, things are falling apart, and everybody blames everybody else. Everybody blames some other side. There's so many sides now. And division just is continuing and continuing. But when we can recognize that God has put within each one of you an ability, that's what I want to talk about that, that this morning, ministry. God has put within each one of us skills, abilities, gifts, talents, whatever you want to call it, in a way that can reach people's hearts that the person next to you can, cannot. They can't do it like you can. Everyone's different. God has put within every person a ministry. And when we can, in a sense, learn about that and understand it and begin to look outward, look to people that you don't have to be some great evangelist, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do miracles, you don't have to do any of that stuff. God has put stuff in you that has the ability to actually turn hearts of people around you if we could just see it, if we could just believe it. So we're going to look at that a little bit this morning and speak about ministry. Ministry. And I'm not talking about ministry here. There's a ministry inside, which we will see. And we're going to look at John the Baptist to do that. I'm so sorry. In my bag, my glasses. So you guys, give me one second. So sorry. As you know, this started last year. Apparently, I need, I need glasses. So you go to John chapter 1. It'll come up behind me. I'm reading on, out of the New Living Translation. But we're going to look at John the Baptist as a... Now, be careful because he is, not our, he is not our prototype. He is not our model of ministry. Jesus Christ is. 
But there are things that we can learn from the attitude in this man and from what he did as the opening of the New Testament that I believe apply to every ministry. I pray that this morning is, is oh goodness gracious, and the time we have left is liberating, not limiting. I really do. So let's read this. In the beginning, John 1 verse 1, the Word already existed. The Word was God, and the Word was, the word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word obviously speaking about? Say it again. Okay. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word, being Jesus, gave life to everything that was created. People to tell me, I met people there, I believe in God but not Jesus. I met a fifth generation Jehovah's Witness there. First day, extra second day. Fifth generation Jehovah's Witness. He called himself Jehovah's Witness Royalty. And I mean, we even went into Starbucks on one of our walks. I didn't have any coffee, I didn't cheat, relax. <laughs> and they pointed him out. Look who it is, and I won't say his name, but they, they knew him straight away from magazines. His father leads watchtowers. I mean, it's, he's a big deal there. And I got to sit down with him, and he had been through what they call, I don't even know it was such a thing, a year of humiliation. He did something very minor wrong, and he had to attend everything. No one's allowed to speak to him, even treat him like he exists for a year. And his heart was broken. And I began to speak to him about the book of Galatians. And I said, you know the book of Galatians talks about the combination of legalism, legalism and carnality. In other words, the Christian mask has to get thicker, but what I'm doing is getting worse. And that those two go together. And I explained the gospel to this man. He sat there and wept and wept and wept. And he said, well, Jesus, this and then I read him this. It was Jesus who gave life to everything. God created everything through him. Nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. First five verses are this incredible focus on the preeminence of Christ. Then verse 6, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word, being Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The thing that struck me when I was there and reading it is the first five verses is about this preeminence of Jesus. Jesus is and was God. Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus, this is who Christ is. And then it says, in a sense, out of the blue, and God sent a man. And I'm there surrounded by people that have no idea about the first five verses. And it's like that verse went right through my heart, pierced me. And you know that every believer, you can literally put yourself there. It says, God sent a man, John the Baptist. I have to ask you, do you believe that God has sent you? Because God believes that he has sent you. But because we get so churchified, we think, well, I can't witness because I can't do that, looking at what we do up here. So many gifts and ministries that God has put in you won't find expression when the church gathers because the point is they're not for here. God sent a man. Put your name in that. Honestly, actually do that. God sent a woman. God sent a man. His name was. Her name is. Put your name there. 
John struggled, he had doubts, go read Matthew 11, he was a normal person. But God will send a person. It's this is who Jesus is. So God sends a person. To do what? It's to tell about the light. God sends people to other people. To do what? To tell about the first five verses. This is who Jesus is. For what purpose? So that everyone might believe. Now, we read that when you're reading the first few verses and you think, my goodness, well, not everyone's going to believe me. Not everyone believed John. It tells you that a few verses later. So that those who did believe may have the right to be called children of God. In other words, God sent John so that everyone might believe his testimony. And not everyone did. Because God is a bad expression, but God lives and dies in a sense to protect free will. Don't worry about effectiveness. Don't focus on that at all. We're going to get to some of that in a moment. It says, He came into the world that He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. He came to His own people that rejected Him, verse 12, but to all who believed and to all accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. So, ministry. Let's get practical. I'm hoping today is going to be quite practical. Every person has a ministry that God has put inside of them. And people say, what does that mean? Hopefully by the end of the day, you'll understand this. Because it's actually very simple. The problem often is, especially in churchianity, is people do nothing. They run around going, what's my ministry? What's my ministry? And it becomes all about me and trying to build my ministry, and I don't do anything until I figure that out. Don't do that. The word ministry just means serve, servant. So focus on serving others, focus on getting involved, and being a servant to others, not by identity, but by practice. By identity, you're a child of God, a son and a daughter. But in practice, God has sent people to people. And as you focus on serving, and there will be things in you that suddenly God uses differently to something else. It's like He's put ministries, giftings, anointings, things inside of every person that will have greater impact. Am I making sense to you? So, as we look at this year, let's quickly learn some lessons about John the Baptist. So let's go to verse 19. We're just going to read the rest of this, and then we'll do some practical things. Verse 19, this was John testi John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. That should be the attitude of every person in ministry. And I mean in ministry, in your business, every person's in ministry. I am not the one. I am not him. Well, then who are you, they asked. Are you Elijah? He, no, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? This will happen to you when you start to actually turn your life into a kingdom life. People will push you. People will question you. Why are you doing that? Why are you telling me this? Who do you think you are? People will do this when you take a normal life and turn it into a kingdom life. I encourage you, let your response be like his response. His response was not what people thought or what they thought. His response about is what God said about him. He said this, who are you? And he answered. Uh, John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am the voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. You can be secure in your identity when you know what God says about you. Until you know what He says about you, I, I don't know how else to say this, you can't. You can't be secure in your identity because people will cancel you, come against you, people will do all sorts of things inspired by the enemy even though they know it not. And until you know who God says you are and until you're secure in that, you will fluctuate. And that just takes time. But when you know who he says you are, it's okay. It's okay. He says, verse 24, Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, If you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, 
What right do you have to baptize? John told him, I baptize with water. But right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. And though his ministry follows mine, I am not even worthy to be slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming and said to him, uh, t- t- John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me, even though John naturally was older than him. Okay? He existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah. Very important. Do you see that? I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I, again, I didn't know he was the one. But when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. In other words, this may sound strange, but John was literally, he's saying, of myself, I couldn't recognize him. I couldn't straight away go, that's the one. Think about this, was his cousin. So basically, John is baptizing and goes, nope, nope, not him, baptizing, doing a ministry, doing what God's told him to do, but there's a reason he's doing that. He's waiting. So, every ministry, I I, I trust you guys understand, I, I don't have the time to get into it. I trust that's clear. Every one of you have a ministry inside of you. Every single person has a ministry, an ability, a gift, something that God has put inside of you that is different and unique to every other person. Don't live in comparison. The church does it too much. The Bible actually says those who compare themselves to another are not wise. So I tell my boys, stop comparing yourself because you don't want to be a fool. Don't live in comparison. But every true ministry has certain things that come along with it. And I'm going to quickly go over those as fast as I can. But every true ministry, number one, has an altar. An altar. A place of sacrifice for that ministry to become effective. Luke 180 says, talking about John the Baptist, the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. I'd like you to imagine for a moment this man's life. At some point, he realized that the prophecies in Isaiah were about him. Imagine that. At some point, he dared to believe, this is speaking about me. Have you ever dared to believe something good that God has said about you through someone else? And you think, surely not me, surely not me, surely not me. But you come to a place in your life of maturity, not pride, where you're like, actually, that is who God says I am. That is me. This man went through that. Where did he go through that? In the desert by himself. 30 years. It actually says that. It says he was in the wilderness, in the desert, until the day of his public appearance. For 30 years, he's in the desert, working things out with the Lord. And we think, oh, that... Friends, 30 years. All the fanfare of his birth, Zechariah, the angel, all of that would have died down and been forgotten by most. And he's out there having encounters with the Lord, obviously, because he said, God told me to do this. He was the only one on the earth that knew why Jesus had come, because he said, this is the Lamb of God. He understood sacrifice. The Bible says that was a mystery, even hidden from the enemy and the unseen realm that religious leaders No one understood why. The first time John saw Jesus, he said, that's who he is, not only who he is, this is what he's come to do. He's a lamb. He's here to pay for sin. The lamb of God, the sacrifice to take. Only he knew he had been having all these private encounters. God literally giving him details. Do this, do that. When nobody was around, and it's like an altar sometimes 
it's like you die inside. It's like you die inside. But something else is coming alive. The Spirit of God. And the only place that an altar starts to have meaning is in the secret place of His presence. No one can do that for you. And you can't earn anything. The sacrifice that matters is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You can't be like, well, I'm in a beast. No. Friends, there's, there's all sorts of altars. It's all sorts of like altars in a person's life. Many, uh, just a few. Altars of restraint. Man, I've been through this one. Any visionary, any uh, visionary CEO, creative person, they feel this. I used to tell Jen, that red light, I've, every red light I came to him like, this is prohibiting my call. It should be green. It's just, <laughs> it, it just restraint. It's like, <clears throat> I'd get frustrated with, if I can be honest, not with people, but with the bureaucracy of the church. Like, Lord, let's just forget all of this stuff and this person and that person and titles and our, let's just you and me, let's just go. It's restraint. It feels restraining. And then you, <coughs> sorry, you get a little older and you look back and you realize that the restraint was there to keep you safe. That the restraint was there to teach you lessons. The restraint was there to teach you self-control. The restraint was there to teach you it's not about you. But it's like an altar of restraint. What about an altar of mystery? When something happens and you have to give up the right to understand. I do not understand, Lord. He's like, I know. I do. <laughs> Is that enough for you? No. People say it's super spiritual. Oh, I give up the right to understand until they go through it. Then they're like, why? Nothing. It's like an altar of mystery. You die there. But something comes alive. Something inside of you just... Whoosh. And now you know the Lord different. Because you trust Him. An altar of mystery will teach you trust. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. Altar, altars of tragedy. Altars of reputational loss. These are all altars in a person's life. And every true ministry and every one of you have ministry and ministries in you. There's an altar. And you can't always choose them. You choose the first one. I surrender my life to you. I give you my life. And then you go through something. You're like, but not that. Every ministry has an anointing. This is the nice one. Better put it after altar, give people something. It says here, Matthew 3, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea, look what it had started with. He came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Verse 5, all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river confessing their sins. And anointing is visible by people. They will come to you. You don't have to force them. Let them come. Yes, yes, you have to reach out and stuff, but every ministry has an anointing. An anointing is like this fancy word and the church is so messed it up sometimes. It is very simply the ability or the gift that God puts upon you. It's the Holy Spirit upon a person and sometimes it's so practical and so natural that you miss it. Because we think of anointing as the anointed man the preaching or the worship. But the anointing is just the ability of the Holy Spirit on your life, on something in your life. It's just that simple. It says in those days. Imagine the anointing on this man, John the Baptist. Think about this. In those days. Well, what days were those? 400 years of silence from the Lord. 
400 years of silence between the testament. And this man goes out in the desert, goes through some altars, comes back, and starts to preach into a vacuum of 400 years of silence. And the anointing on him is so great that people think about this in today. This was like the same in their day, that people went out publicly, stood there, and confessed their sins. Such was the anointing on this man. Yet he did no miracles. Zero. It is the ability of God upon a very practical way. My dad used to explain it. He used to hold a microphone, but now we have this. He said an anointing is like this. I'm speaking in a normal volume, but the microphone amplifies it. I don't have to shout. This does it. The Holy Spirit on your life, you can do something normal, something practical, and the Holy Spirit will take what you do and whoo, doesn't mean I put more effort in. That's flesh. The anointing will take something very normal and woof and make it seem much better, much bigger. And John, it says, he himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. Therefore, the most dampening effect on the anointing in a person's life is when you draw people to yourself. Don't do that. I encourage you. It doesn't end well. Point people to the King. Point people to the Lord. The Lord will put an anointing on you. People will start to praise you or people will start to, wow, look at how God, that person does this. Just po- don't be super spiritual and weird. Just point it to the Lord. Just point it to the Lord. So the Lord comes along and He will anoint people. Look at, look at this. Luke 1 verse 15. Speaking about John the Baptist, the angel to Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, it says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, before the Lord, before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient of the wisdom to the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, very quickly, the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah, okay? Think of Elijah. Elijah, who did incredible miracles, literally brought heaven to earth at certain times, conquered thrones, took down corrupt systems, killed the occultists, did incredible, like there's not very many people like Elijah. And it says, this man, John, is going to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And he does not one miracle. So therefore, what is the spirit and power of Elijah? It is the anointing on a person, on any person, to do whatever is necessary to turn the person's heart next to you towards the Lord. People say, well, that's not true. Well, let's read what it says. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts. It's in the Bible. Do you believe and do you know that you as a believer have within you the spirit and power of Elijah? It wasn't just a John the Baptist thing. It's a New Testament thing. That God has put a gifting in you. God has put an ability in you. God has put a practical thing in your life that is anointed from on high. And when you do that, people around you's hearts will start to turn to the Lord. And it's so normal and practical, which I'll explain next, (laughs) that we miss it. Let me go there quickly. Um, So let's go to the next one real quick. Every true ministry has an area. John's area was the wilderness, but your area can grow as a demonstrated area. It started in the wilderness, but it grew to that region. And your area doesn't just mean physical. Every anointing can be an area of life, can be finance, can be the marketplace, can be uh, an age group. I've seen some people that are so anointed to deal with a certain age group, that age group just becomes, they just love the Lord when this person's doing it. And the person next to them, if they tried it, would be a disaster. God is not a favor, doesn't have favorites, but he puts different anointings and gifts. And, and there are areas. John the Baptist was called to an area. 
you are called to areas. There are areas where what is in your life will function well and quick and easy. But then there's an action. There's something that we do. <laughs> I'm wondering, Lord, should I do this now or next week? People are like, shh, don't say that. <laughs> An action. Can I do this really fast? Every true ministry, because I'm trusting this is helpful. Because when we see how normal this is, this is when it comes together. Every true ministry has an action. What do I mean? It says, John, the scriptures up behind me, Mark 1 4, John came baptizing. John 1, God sent me to baptize. But we read earlier, what did it say? God sent Jesus, to, God sent John the Baptist, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to do what? To tell about the light. The purpose of his, bapt, of his baptizing was to reveal the Lord to Israel. So watch this. Let's read carefully. Verse 24, the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah, the Elijah, the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not worthy to be his slave. We read that. Verse 29, then John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said a man who's coming after me is greater than me. Verse 31, I did not recognize him as the Messiah. But I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed. Go to verse 33. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descend on like a dove. In other words, God has sent me. God sends a man. God sends a woman. This is who Jesus is. God sends a man. God sends a woman. John the Baptist. Deborah. Brian. God sent someone. Then he gives you something to do, something very practical, something very normal. And baptism might be in a bad example because we still baptize people today. But he gave John an action. Do this. While you do this, it will teach you to recognize the Lord. Because John said, I can't, I can't look and be like, there he is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But the Lord told me to do this. And while I do, nope, nope, while I do this, I will learn to recognize the Lord. And then after that, people, other people will see the Lord through the same thing. And it's like that in every person's life. There are things that are so practical to you, so normal, that are actually anointed by the Holy Spirit in your life that is different to people next to you, that as you begin to, as you're faithful with it, as you serve others with it, it will actually teach you to recognize Jesus in it, his presence, how he works, how he uses you. For some people, it could be so, and it's something you do. It's not super spiritual. It could, hospitality. There are some people that are so anointed, I think of the pools. Sorry to your names on the recording. Kevin Poole, the address is no. <laughs> I think of the pools. You go to their home. It's not how clean their house is or not. It's not where how the furniture is. It's not getting a decorator to do everything to psychologically convince people. It's not that. It's just them. The smuckers are the same. They just have an ability, without being super spiritual, to make you feel at home to cause you to open up your hearts, to cause you to just speak. It's actually an anointing. The Holy Spirit on their life, that through that, people's hearts will be turned to the Lord. I think of some of you, it's your career. Some of you, it's your kids. Some of you, it's parenting. We have two chiropractors, and, well, we have more, but two chiropractors that I know of in the church well, Jaime and someone else, I won't say his name, it starts with Ga and ends in Re. And when they speak about chiropractic, it's like they're speaking about Scripture. They've spoken to me about what they do, and they're weeping. They're like, this God's in the, like, they, like, don't you understand? Like, and when they do that normal thing, 
people's hearts will be turned to the Lord. Because God has given them something to do in which they recognize the Lord. And then as they continue to be faithful with it, other people will begin to recognize the Lord, just like John the Baptist. And it's so simple, and it's so practical. <coughs> it really is so simple. It could be playing the piano. There's a gentleman by the name of Jay Ripley who helped start this church. He hasn't preached a lot. I mean, he may have used to. I don't know. His son's here. But when that man sits and plays the piano, you recognize the Lord. And he doesn't try to be like someone else. Just play the piano. My wife is worship. When she worships, she learned to recognize the Lord in worship. Now we can all recognize the Lord through her worship. I mean, it's not through her, but you understand. We're all worshiping the Lord. It's so practical. Donna's business. That man will reach out the world and change people's lives. You know, people ask me for business advice. It's, it's phone this guy. I'm going to steer you all sorts of wrong. That guy. And they, they end up in tears. They speak five minutes about business, the rest of the time about the Lord, and he solves their business problem. That's an anointing. Why leave the business world to go into ministry when you have a ministry in you? I've seen so many businessmen leave that and super spiritualize it and do this, and it's actually failing God's call. No, go make money. Go be faithful with that. Some of you, I'll give honor quickly to a man by the name of Vince Leparo. That man has an ability to take a brand new believer or a person who's not yet a believer and just have them work in his shop with him. And by the end of that month, that person is saved, wants to know how to hear the voice of the Lord, and loves people. With, and especially young people. He puts them in his truck, come with me to the hardware, just drive. I've never seen anyone do it like this guy. It's unbelievable. And like some of the worst sorts. And he just flips him on a dime. Easy. Without, it's not hard for him. And, you know, for some of you, it's the gym. I mean, we could go on. Practical things. God has put ministries in you that when you do it, yes, we always need to be reaching out, but there are parts of you that are so quickly more effective. And there are some people here that are under a lie of the enemy going, well, I just have none. Firstly, don't be a victim. Secondly, that's a lie. And if you don't know who they are, ask your family or what they are. Your family, when you do that, something in me just comes alive. It is so simple. I mean, I have to end it there. Well, let me just give you the last one. <laughs> I mean that, it'll be quick. And the last one is actually the most important, attitude. Every ministry has an attitude. John the Baptist came baptizing, why? To reveal the Messiah to Israel. Every ministry has an attitude that you develop. So people say, well, what do I focus on this year? How do I reach out to others? Don't focus on the anointing. Don't focus on altars or tough times. Don't focus on any of the things I said. Focus on one thing. What is my attitude? What is my attitude? I, the ministry, the things, the things that God has put within me has been given for one reason. The, the anointed actions I take, whatever they are, has been given to me for one reason. To reveal God. To reveal who Jesus Christ is. Because only the Spirit can turn the hearts of the people around me. The world is absolutely desperate to discover the truth. I'm asking you this year, and we're going to maybe go into this, but don't be afraid of what's happening. Ask the Lord, Lord, teach me to position myself to be effective, not by increased effort, but by your ability through me in the most normal, practical ways, and look at people out there. I met a lady there, I'll end with this. Firstly, one of the doctors who was a, some... 
I don't know, he had so many idols in his house. Egypt, Egyptology, Freemasonry, occultism, Buddhism, I mean, you name it, he had them. He's just trying to cover all his bases. And he says, in all the years I've been here, I've never wanted to take a patient to my house. But please, can you come to my house? I said, sure. We went there for lunch hour, played ping pong. I didn't try to like, evangelize the guy, just played ping pong with him. Next day he comes to me. I don't, I don't know why, can you come back? I said, yeah, I'll come back. I stayed for two hours, met his in-laws, with the whole family. Sitting around the fire another night, just sitting around the fire. It's a young, um, not just my age, maybe a bit older. So, you know, she hears I'm a Christian because I'm worshiping on the deck. And she's like, I don't know, just, uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, my sister's on to all of that. I like, I believe in God, but never experienced him, never this, never that. Now, this is, again, how the Lord uses me. Don't try to be that, be you. So I said, so you would like to experience, like, sense the Lord, like, presence. She said, I've always wanted that. I don't, it's never happened. I don't even know if it's real anymore. I said, give me your hand. Sitting around the fire, I said, just give me a hand. She's like, what do you mean? I said, just give me your hand. She gives me a hand, and I said, Lord, show her, please. And the presence of God hit that woman. She started to shake, started to weep, and we, I went back to chopping wood. I did. I left her there. I just, <laughs> I mean, she took a good long while to, because it's not what I do. It's not. It's what the Lord does through you. And I know that sounds so cliched, but there are things in your life, friends. You have ministries in you, and every single one of them are a part of the greater ministry called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you cannot build your ministry, but let your attitude be on the gospel, how do I use this to reach the lost? You'll be amazed the positions God will put you in this year. Amazed. But turn... Turn the eye outward. That's all I'm asking. Bless you. Sorry I went long. I guess I'm back. But uh, yeah. bless you all. <laughs>